Good morning, everyone. My name is Mahendra Mahay. I'm the manager of British Library Labs, or BL Labs. I apologize that I can't be there today in Lithuania. I hope you're having a great time. I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing on BL Labs, which was set up in March 2013 to get people to experiment with our digital collections. Over that time, we supported over 175 projects with researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, educators, and even British Library staff. We've largely done this through competitions, awards, and projects. And we're helping to build a global community of labs around the world, whether they are in galleries, libraries, archives, or museums. At the bottom of my slides are links to where you can download them, at my, an email address to contact me and various social media handles. Here's a link to the full URL um, if you would like to download my slides or download the, the video. The British Library is one of the largest libraries in the world. Our collections are vast. In fact, just to give you an idea of the scale of our collections, only 9% of our collections are actually books. We estimate we have about 100 mil 180 million items, and that's about 16 million books. We also have things like patents, stamps, maps, sound recordings, musical scores, manuscripts, and serial titles. What is a digital gallery, library, archive, and museum glam lab? It's a space in a GLAM to experiment and innovate online or on-site with the institution's digitized and or born digital collections and data. It needs labber type people to make it work. They have qualities such as they, they want to share, they want to be open and encourage experimentation, take risks. They try to overcome some of the institutional barriers that prevent them from doing their work. It's a kind of formalized disobedience. They often are at the forefront of change and trying to transform the organization digitally. Who does Beale Labs work with? When we were set up to experiment with our digital collections, our primary focus was and always has been our researchers. However, over the years, we've ended up working with artists, librarians, curators, educators, entrepreneurs, archivists, software developers, just to name a few. Beyond Labs works with people. Understanding people is hard, and I'd like to characterize this with a quote. Humans have paleolithic emotions. We often work in medieval institutions, but we've been given this godlike technology. And I think this quote from Edward Osborne Wilson really summarizes the challenges that Labs has working with people. My own personal journey working at the Labs really started by wanting to open it up to enable people who may not know about it to be able to access it. And I brought to the lab my own personal values of openness, sharing, kindness, play, experimentation, formalized disobedience, wanting to disrupt, challenging the status quo, trying to establish meaning in what I do. If you're interested, there's a link to an article in an Estonian newspaper uh, where I was interviewed about my approach. So how do we engage with people at BL Labs? We often organize competitions where we ask people to come up with ideas of what to do with our digital content. And we've been doing that since the inception of the lab. We now have developed that into something called digital research support, where you can make an application 
to tell us what you would like to do with our digital collections and then we can give you advice. We run annual awards where we ask people to tell us what they have already done with our digital content in research, artistic, commercial, learning and teaching, community-based and staff categories. And often our work revolves around projects, collaborative projects. Effectively, what we're trying to do is generate engagement with people, develop ideas, excitement, energy around our collections. We do this through roadshows, events, social media, one-to-one -one meetings and conversations. Here's some statistics of the engagement, to summarise the engagement we've had over the years. Just to sort of say, we've done a lot of work talking to people and we've had lots of engagement. The way we work in our lab is to connect our audience with our digital collections. We have their interests and we have our digital collections, which are in fact only a small proportion of our physical collections. At the British Library, this is about 4%. We work in this area where there's a sweet spot, the intersection. It looks deceptively easy, but in fact, it's really difficult. It requires a lot of hard work and engagement, given the fact that the proportion of our collections, digital collections, is actually much smaller than our physical collections. And our digital collections can often seem random. What kind of engagement does the British Library have with people wanting to use our content? Hardly ever do we have the following, where we have exactly what our users want. It tends to be we don't have exactly what people are looking for and let's initiate the conversation. And this has largely to do with the fact that our digital collections are only a smaller proportion of our physical collections. This work is hard and constantly requires work to maintain that interest. We tend to attract people who want to work on projects with fuzzier boundaries and those who are possibly more open to interdisciplinary and collaborative research. Over the years, we found that artists and creatives find this conversation easier. I'd like to try to summarize the kinds of interaction we have with people using our lab. The first I would describe as a data journey, where people explore our collections and they also explore the culture of our organisation. Almost always, people's initial ideas change once they experience the culture and the data in the organisation. Sometimes they decide they don't need to use computational methods and sometimes they do. This is often very iterative and lots, involves lots of rethinking. But by the end of it, we hope they've got a well-informed question which has been based on doing their homework in looking at the collection in the first place. The second phase concentrates on this question deeper and this is where we can often provide support and give some practical advice on what is actually realistically achievable given a specific time period and resources. By the end of it, where we often recommend providing a hard deadline. People can decide what the next steps are going to be on their journey to use our collections. During the exploration phase, people begin to learn that there is actually a really interesting story behind that digital collections, and in fact, all our collections. These are some of the questions that start to begin to emerge. Why was this thing digitized in the first place? Who paid for it? What were the politics when this was digitized? Why was this digitized and not something else? 
who was the personality involved in actually doing the digitization and choosing what got digitized. It's really important on people's journey that they understand this story. And the really important lesson we've learned in the labs is to speak to a human being at the organization who can talk more about this collection because often they know things about the collection that isn't written down. Some of the work at the British Library around our collections has been focusing on the decolonization of our collections and accepting our colonial roots, the British Library's colonial roots, in terms of how our collections were obtained. We have an anti-racist Glam Labs group, which is international, and we have, a, we have various committees at the library that have been set up uh, where we're making a strong commitment to becoming an anti-racist organisation. I'm going to suggest that Glam Labs can address the following challenges. The first one is the return on investment on digitising and capturing born digital collections. It really focuses on the, on the point about how our digital collections are being used. What value and impact are they having on society? Especially when we are focusing on opening the collections for everyone. It also enables us to be reflective on the choices we made in digitization in the first place. Why did we choose to digitize this and not that? And maybe it can help us be wiser in making future decisions about what gets digitized. Labs enable a sharp focus to ask questions such as, what digital collections do we actually have and what can we make av available openly and on site? And really importantly, are we just going to just let them be there or are we going to find new ways to tell people about them? People won't necessarily come to us, so we need to sort of be able to get them to come to us. And also we need to ask ourselves and be honest, do we actually have anything of interest that people would want to use? Once people start looking and accessing our digital collections, are we providing the right support mechanisms for them to, to do experimentation, both manually and computationally? So, are we providing the right access? Can they discover our collections easily? Do we provide any advice and guidance or even technical support? Do we need to provide training? In essence, are we providing the right services, tools and processes to facilitate access to our digital collections. People are often exploring the feel, the shape, the patterns of our digital collections at scale, or they're looking for needles in haystacks. They often use computational methods to do this because they can potentially be much more efficient. So often glam labs are often found within digital scholarship activity, digital humanities departments within the institution. They're also looking at focusing on the circular value that libraries, galleries, archives and museums provide. Can, they can often help to improve the exploration and augment, augmentation of finding things in often messy cultural heritage data and they can often help improve these things and put that data back to increase access. In essence, Glam Labs focus around discovering and celebrating old culture found in our digital collections and offering the possibility to facilitate research and offer remixing to create often new culture to inspire a new generation and inject some joy and tell new stories about our collections. How do we enable access to our openly licensed cultural heritage? We write collection guides which are written, often written by curators as of uh, yesterday, we have 250 plus of these and they offer subject-based 
uh, journeys through our collections. Each one often has a section on what we have available digitally. In labs, we made a philosophical decision to make all our digital collections and data available as datasets through a portal called data.bl.uk. People can access thousands, thousands of materials in one go through very simple zip files. Each zip file will contain a digital object identifier and we're treating this very much in, in the same way as a data set. We're putting these data sets or digital collections on our open access repository, which is available to everyone in the world. It's really important to put our digital collections where the light is. We can't assume that people will come to us if you build a platform, people may not necessarily come to it. Often the work that Labs does is provide the retail or the shop front of the often invisible warehouse and treasure chest that many institutions have. It's really important institutions put their collections where people will look. They may not necessarily look through our portals. We need to think about where the light is, where the activity is, where the excitement is. Are we providing access to search engines? Are we putting our collections on social media? Are we using famous people to promote our collections? We often use external platforms to, to put our collections on. Effectively, platforms where there is much more light uh, historically, we've done this on Flickr, we're beginning to use Instagram, we're using Wikimedia Commons, the Internet Archive. But the most important thing is to connect. Because the material is in digital form, this offers the possibility to harness computational methods to do things with our collections. Things like location-based searching and geotagging, visualising data, techniques like crowdsourcing or human computation, annotating digital texts, transcribing from uh, digitized texts, things like corpus analysis, text mining, natural language processing, using machine interfaces to our data. Things like machine learning and artificial intelligence are increasingly more common in the work that labs do. But the really important lesson is that Accessing digitized and born digital collections means you may use computational methods over manual methods if relevant. The current interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning is not always relevant. Thankfully, there are still things that humans can do and they're better at doing them than computers at the moment. How do we provide on-site access to digital collections? There are several challenges. Of our 700 digitization born digital projects, only 80, only 20% of them are openly licensed. 80% of that 700 are only available on site, in the reading room or through a paywall. We've developed a residency model, partly through our competition and partly through an application process where we can provide hot desks in staff areas and in the reading room for people to get access to this 80% of our collections that can only be accessed physically on site. Providing on site access to our digital collections is actually very rare for many national libraries. We use our residency model and our hot desks, but we've also developed research spaces within the reading room. We've been collaborating with the Royal Danish Library, the first national library to offer a scalable on-site computational solution, and our UK web archiving team to develop a computational browsing facility using something called Jupyter Notebooks on all our reading room computers. 
we've been looking at the work of Tim Sherratt, who developed something called the GLAM Workbench, who's been using Jupyter Notebooks to provide computational access to a lot of data. Jupyter Notebooks allow us to do some really interesting things with data and digital collections, especially at scale. Here's an example of a Jupyter Notebook that we've developed, which was interrogating a set of digitized books. We were looking for the word telephone as it appeared in the 19th century archive. And what we discovered was that the word telephone appears much earlier in the archive, which is unusual because the telephone wasn't invented until the late 19th century, but here it looks like it appears in some books in the early 19th century. The reason for this was actually quite funny. Those books were that, that were digitized also digitized bookmarks that were left in there much later. We developed our own set of Jupyter Notebooks for all our openly licensed collections and they're available here. Let's now look at some examples of British Library projects which have used our data. There are many different kinds of projects and there's a link on this page if you want to explore our archive. But it can be grouped into different things like research, work, educational, artistic, entrepreneurial and staff awards. Let's have a look at some of these. Some research projects. What I'd like to say generally is that the research through BL Labs can be characterized in the following way. Often researchers are looking for invisible things in our data and digital collections. These things sometimes are often well hidden because the data or the metadata for these collections is often messy, especially to do computational work. But sometimes when, they, when these things are found, they can augment discovery so that data can be put back to improve discovery in the future. Often when these things are found, people are able to tell new stories about what's in our collections. It's really important that we celebrate these new discoveries creatively through events, art and performance. This is a really important lesson we've learned at the library. If we don't do this, how will people know what interesting things that they can do with our collections? One thing that we've learned up in the lab is the people who work in the lab have to practice what they preach. We have to do our own experimentation, or sometimes as we like to call it, eat our own dog food or cat food. Here's an example of something that we did. We carried out an experiment of digitized books, about 65,000 of them. It's about 23 million pages. We wrote an algorithm to cut out all the pictures from these digitized books and run facial recognition algorithms on these images to see if we could identify those images that contained faces. This was a simple experiment which we thought would help improve uh, discovery of images within the collections. Because obviously these images didn't have any descriptions. The only descriptions that were available were those of the books themselves. What we learned was that some of these face recognition algorithms although they were trained on photographs, began to identify some of these collections as faces. In fact, the algorithms were really good at recognizing female faces and they were better than recognizing male faces. We're not sure the re real reasons for this, but we think it might to, with, to do with the fact that men's illustrations were often exaggerated. We then took these cut out images and put them on a public platform, effectively where the light is. It constituted about a million images. And it was one of our earliest experiments. And 
we've had tremendous success in terms of public engagement. We've had over 2 billion views and about 18 million tags have been added to these images. We've also used other platforms like the Internet Archive and Wikimedia Commons to put some of our collections. Just to dig a bit deeper into the tagging side of these million images, what we learned was that there's a bit of a, a misunderstanding about crowdsourcing. About 500,000 people actually added a tag to these, to these million images. But the crowd actually averaged about one tag per person. However, what we have learned is that only a smaller group of people regularly add tags to our collections. And here's three of them. James Heald, Mario Klingerman, and Chico45. James and Mario use computational techniques to add tags to the images. Chico45 is a human tagger, a retired gentleman from Los Angeles who's tagged many, many thousands of images. We've had companies make games to help improve the tagging of these images. And we've even had uh, funded projects to look at how we can make tagging easier. A few years ago, a team, an undergraduate team, Karen Wang, Lu De Zhao, and Brian Doe used artificial intelligence to try to tag all 1 million images with 12 categories. They even tried captioning some of the images. Here is a man standing in a field with a cow, and here is a close-up of a bird on a tree branch. Their work was really impressive. They added 15.5 million tags and about 100,000 captions to those images, which helped improve discovery. Bob Nicholson, another researcher and academic, was particularly interested in finding uh, Victorian jokes in our 19th century newspaper archives. His idea, the Victorian meme machine, was really in part to find jokes in our archives and find a way to repopularize them using images from that era on social media using creating memes. Through this project we created the Mechanical Comedian where we where it publishes a joke every day to see what kind of reaction we get on social media. Here's an example of a Victorian joke. Ethel, I'm ashamed of you. I saw that Frenchman in the conservatory kissing you repeatedly. Why didn't you tell him to stop? I couldn't, Jack. You couldn't? Why not? I can't speak French. Bob's had a lot of success on this project. He's interviewed people. He's told general public some of these terrible jokes. Um, he's also received further funding. And we've even had a comedy night at the British Library to bring and celebrate these jokes. And even artists like Rob Walker have taken some of these jokes and created interesting animations. Links are provided on the slides. Hannah Rose Murray was another researcher who was looking for uh, the evidence of the performances of the black abolitionists in 19th century newspapers. Hannah was particularly interested in finding out where these performances took place in UK newspapers and plotting them on a map. We were able to discover some really interesting patterns and it, we also um, culminated her work in a artistic performance at the British Library where we retold some of these interesting stories. Now let's briefly talk about some educational uses of our collections. World of Stories by Victoria Primary School was a collaborative project working with children and parents in a, in a London school 
where they took images from the British Library and wrote short stories which were then put together as part of a book and sold. Labs has worked with senior schools on placement projects for students where we have worked with individuals where they have been given jobs to curate some of our collections. So this is Ruby Dixon and Nadia Mirianova, who as part of their school work experience had to curate collections of books from a very large collection of books. For example, Finnish titles and books that uh, were in the Russian language. In labs, we've also been working with universities to work with students on projects where we give them some collections and their job is to curate smaller collections from these large collections. They often have to clean up the data, they often have to visualize it, and they've worked on various projects such as identifying Christian texts in large corpora, uh, female authors, queens of Britain, theater and travel. Leon Labs has been working with the Australian National University in Canberra and the Center for Digital Humanities Research on data projects. This is where students work in groups on data projects and where they have to produce an app or a visualization <coughs> or something with that data. So we've had projects like that have, that have created Chinatown tours, uh, an app for experiencing the depression of a composer or the endangered species of a botanical garden. Labs work on a number of artistic projects. David Normal, uh, a Californian artist, created the Crossroads of Curiosity which took some of our images from books and created collages. These are four collages he created based on taking images from our digitized books, which he made into paintings. These paintings were made into light boxes, very large light boxes, which were exhibited at Burning Man in 2014. And then we worked with the artist to bring that artwork to the British Library and in 2015 they were exhibited outside in the piazza and you can see David there. We even worked on an augmented reality app to take those images back to the books where they came from. Mario Klingman is a code artist and he was actually the first BL Labs Artistic Award winner. Mario did some really interesting computational curation with some of our images. For example, on the left, you can see 44 men who look about 44 years old. On the right, you can see a collection of images he calls a hat on the ground spells trouble, which was curated computationally. Mario also won the Lumen Prize, which is the Digital Arts Prize in 2018, where he used our AI and a collection of portrait paintings for the computer to generate its own portrait. In 2019, I worked with the artist Michael Takio Magruder to take four digitized city maps of New York, London, Paris and Chicago and manifest them as artworks at the British Library, either physical artworks or digital artworks. It was a very successful exhibition. We had over 150,000 visitors. We had talks and events and even a book. We've also worked with musicians and we've worked on developing something called Algo Raves. This is where we give the artist a set of data and they take our data and they perform it. Um, it tends to be electronic music generated algorithmically. We then worked as part of a launch for the Imaginary Cities exhibition on developing a very large algo rave where 700 people attended, where people were given our data to 
perform. We've even used digitized Elizabethan manuscript images to create a fashion collection. And this is a fashion collection developed by Nabil Nayal for London Fashion Week, which was inspired by the British Library's collections. So just to finish off, I'm going to summarize the work of labs and give you some thoughts. So here's a dozen BL Labs lessons. And there's a warning that some of these messages may be a little bit difficult, especially for risk averse institutions. The first lesson, it's really important that engagement starts with you, with people. Explore your own inner labour. Start a conversation, generate positive energy, encourage play, play and experimentation. And where possible, try to support as many ideas as is humanly possible. Try to be inviting, kind, nice, and want to share and genuinely want to help people. It's important to start small, but think big. Start with small experiments. Digital use can be really simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. But it's okay to think big. What we've learned in the labs is that one size does not necessarily fit all. And what this means is that uh, we often have to adapt our support depending on the inquiries that people give us. It's really important that the institution has policies and processes for digital reuse. Without these, they can often cripple use. It's important to keep things simple, open, and not try to overcomplicate or over-engineer, and really important to share. It's important to be brave, fail fast, take risks. And labs tend to reject perfectionism. It doesn't enable rapid progress. Sometimes the philosophy of good enough is often good enough. It's really important that there's a lot of failure in labs. Success is rare, failure is common. It's important to take risks. Success really only happens with the right people, the right place and the right time. It hardly ever happens actually. It's important to embrace failure, develop a culture of supporting it, learn from it. It's often our best teacher. Training or collaboration, exploring data, working with digital collections can be difficult, especially large ones. It often requires specific kill skills and capabilities that many of our users and cultural heritage organizations don't have. Do we provide training or do we provide the connection with people who have those skills? Services that allow useful exploration of cultural heritage data are rare. Here's an example of spelling variations of the same word like the USA. This makes discovery very challenging. Data is often messy for computational analysis and we just have to embrace this. Also, I would really encourage people to run competitions. It's a really good way to start and engage in, uh, and start engagement with your collections. One lesson we've learned is that uh, we give our entrants their own intellectual property. They own their own intellectual property. But it's really important that all ideas are published because it's a good way to create a circular value to generate further ideas in the future. It's finally, it's really important to celebrate the uses of digital collections. We run awards for those already using our digital materials. It's a great way to find out who is doing what with your digital, co digital content. This enables a, a, a virtuous circle. It engages and inspires new users to come up with their own ideas. I'd like to just finish off with some work we've been doing on trying to share this practice around the world. We're building a global labs community, a glam labs community. We've come together a number of times and we've even developed a book, which we developed through a book sprint where 16 of us were locked in a hotel for five days and we had to write a book about how you would set up a glam lab 
it's freely available, it's open access, please download it if you're interested. Working with digital collections, getting people to use our collections is hard work. There is no magic formula. But often magic is created because the hard work to enable it is invisible. Working with digital collections requires lots of engagement. It's really important institutions connect and inspire their user community. Don't expect them to come to you. Thank you very much. Here are a list of possible questions and over to you.